Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, it's uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, some of my um, research topics. Uh, since you know, um, I I actually watched a bit of the um, you know, online video from uh, this seminar series. It looks like it's very broad, very diverse, and. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I have some, uh, you know, technical details here, but uh, I will not touch too much about that. Uh, rather, I want to share some of, uh, you know, our application problems. And uh, uh, from this application problem, we can see uh, there are, um, you know, some grand challenging issues, uh, especially sustainable uh, issues in climate change, in, in like material uh, science, some of their natural hazards. and. Uh, and uh, how do we address that by, you know, some of their machine learning AI techniques? In particular, there is this concept of uh, predictive uh, uh, digital twins and, um, and to model this complex system and to steer this complex system. So um, um, I, I have a group. Uh, the group is focused on scientific... Okay. That up a little, so your All right. Is yeah. Great. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the, the group's uh, research is focused on scientific machine learning and also uh, uncertainty quantification. Um, you know, essentially, everything is uncertain. How do we quantify these uncertainties? Um, so I'm from the school of uh, CSE, uh, just across the street at Dakota. And uh, uh, yeah, OK, uh, let me see if I can move. All right, so um, let me mention this example. This is a, a groundwater contaminant remediation problem. So you can see here on the uh, bottom left, you have the contaminant source here, for instance, like some nuclear source or some other like a chemical uh, contaminant source. And over the years, um, this source can be transported from uh, a specific location to some other locations where, you know, there, uh, for instance, municipal wells are located. And then uh, there will be certain contaminant in the water, uh, for instance, like the drinking water, or uh, daily use water. So uh, over the years, let's say, uh, we have uh, some simulations, um, about five years, 10 years, and uh, you can see there are uh, a concentration or there sort of like the density of this contaminant uh, apparently is transported by the groundwater uh, flow. And uh, so uh, uh, we want to learn this process, but whatever is on the ground, we can't really see it. Uh, we can dig some well, for instance. Um, like uh, some observation well, some remediation well, once we dig this well, uh, we can purify uh, the water, or we can sort of like a dual uh, process in this contaminant uh, water. Uh, well, uh, during this process, uh, there are quite a few different uh, questions that we can ask. Um, so the first would be, um, you know, so how do you predict the contaminant concentration at the municipal wells? Uh, in particular, from their you know, uncertain um, permeability, like the soil sand permeability, uh, and so if if it, this is unknown, it's uncertain. Uh, how can you predict the contaminant concentration over the years? And uh, so this contaminant, uh, you know, is transported by this groundwater flow. Uh, there is a couple of other mathematical model to describe the concentration of the contaminant. So the first problem is uh, to predict. Um, this concentration, right? And the second problem is, uh, uh, suppose I have uh, some observation, uh, I have uh, some measurement data uh, at some wells. Um, how can we properly learn this process? Essentially, you know, we have, a, for instance, like the soil permeability, which is uncertain. Can we learn about that? Can we infer this permeability uh, field? Because it's, you know, it's especially um, uh, distributed field. It's a random field. And uh, so this is sort of like a learning problem or inverse problem. Um, and then the next question is about, uh, um, so you can make the observation or you can collect the data from some uh, observation wells, right? Like uh, where do you dig the wells to make the observation, right? So this is sort of like an experimental design problem. You want to do some uh, experiment and you want to do some configuration of your system to collect the data, for instance. Uh, this is a, like a, you know, specifically you want to play some sensor or some uh, observation wells. Um, and uh, then the next problem is um, where should the remediation wells be placed? Because you can remediate their, uh, you know, their uh, contaminant uh, source, essentially can purify it at uh, somewhere. 
uh, where if the con concentrations are pretty high, uh, you know, you can dig well there to remedy it. And also, if there is a, some strategic or very critical uh, locations where, you know, the water pass by to the municipal wells, you can also uh, do the remediation there, right? So the question is, uh, uh, where should we, um, you know, dig this remediation well? And this is sort of like an optimal design problem, which is also an optimization problem. You want to optimize the location of the remediation wells. Um, and uh, then the next question is, uh, once you, let's say, dig the remediation wells, and then you need to do the extraction and uh, the treatment of their uh, contaminant source, right? And uh, so the specific question is, uh, um, how do you control the extraction or injection rate of your fluid? And this is an optimal control problem. As you can see, for this, um, relatively speaking, um, uh, quite a simple problem, there are many different questions you can ask. And in fact, uh, from this problem, uh, there is uh, some abstract framework. So first of all, you have some data of your system. You can make some observation or uh, you know some, um, some, some information or knowledge about the contaminant source or um, let's say the, you know, the, the ground property, on the ground water um, flow uh, information. So there is something like a data you can measure, you can uh, collect. And based on this data, you can make some model. You can build some like mathematical model based on let's say first principles or based on some statistical model, some uh, machine learning model. And this model describes uh, uh, the physical process. Like for instance, you have a, um, the source get transported by the transport uh, equations or the model that describes this transport. And then you want to learn some of the parameters in the model, right? Like uh, uh, from this data. So after you collect the data, uh, you make suitable model that can describe the process and then want to learn the model, in particular some of the parameters in the model. Like, uh, you know, you have uh, some of the boundary conditions, the source term, the permeability field, for instance, itself is unknown. And you want to learn this model. With this well calibrated model from this data, you want to make some prediction, right? Like a predict of the concentration um, at a certain location over the years. Uh, so based on their uh, prediction, we can do some optimization, like how do we best remediate their uh, contaminant source, right? Like, uh, so you can see here, um, there is a certain um, elements uh, quite um, tightly integrated with each other from the data to model by learning, in particular in statistical or Bayesian inference. And then you can make predictions, you can make uh, optimization, but all of these um, elements, they're under uncertainty, essentially. You know, when you make the observation, there's some observation noise, measurement noise. And uh, when you have a model, there are some uh, parameters you are not knowing. Uh, it's uncertain. Or maybe the model itself is not uh, good enough, the model inadequate, right? And uh, when you solve the optimization problem, there are some stochastic environment. Another example would be like the COVID, right? For instance, you can learn uh, some model, um, let's say epidemiological model from your data observation of your, let's say, confirmed cases, hospitalized cases, and you want to implement some op uh, optimal mitigation strategy um, to slow down their you know, disease or to, let's say, not overwhelm the hospital capacity and also at the same time not impact their economy at the same time. Um, well, so uh, the many different um, application problems that we can use this framework um, to describe and to model, to simulate, and also eventually to do some uh, uh, optimization for decision making. Uh, this framework is essentially what we call this a predictive uh, and digital twins. For some physical process, we can build some digital uh, counterpart, and uh, we can learn from this physical process by acquiring the data, and also we can steer the system uh, to different directions, to different objectives uh, um, with uh, you know, the simulated process. Um, okay, so before I go, you know, to the technical uh, details of uh, how we're going to deal with this modeling, simulation, and, uh, you know, um, solution of these problems, I'd like to uh, show another few um, examples that we are currently working on. Uh, so uh, this one is about, uh, you know, Antarctica ice sheet flow. With the current uh, global warming, uh, we know that there is a um, a significant uh, evidence that the, their ice sheet is actually um, flow uh, faster uh, past their you know last few uh, decades, and it, here we can see some of the data that we collected from the satellite. 
you can see uh, the different colors of the Antarctica uh, ice flow. And this is uh, essentially the magnitude of the velocity. You can see somewhere along the boundary, um, you know, the velocity uh, is uh, quite high. And uh, so we can model this process, essentially the ice sheet flow process by some mathematical model based on first principle. Uh, uh, like for instance here, some uh, fluid flow, incompressible fluid flow, and nonlinear viscous uh, incompressible fluid flow. Um, and then the uncertainty would be, well actually, you know, there is a, um, a very a thick layer of ice, um, but this um, ice are not equally distributed. There is a, a bad rock. So there is a, the boundary between the ice and uh, the rock. You don't really know about their condition of you know, the information from the uh, boundary. So uh, this is a so-called the basal sliding field in the boundary condition. We want to learn this boundary condition. So this boundary condition is quite determinant uh, for the prediction in the, into the future. So when I learn this um, prediction by, you know, the data, the observed data from the satellite. So for instance, here, uh, this is a field variable uh, that you can infer by solving some inverse problem. Um, this is a, 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 um, at the bottom. So essentially uh, the boundary condition. And uh, uh, so you can solve this inverse problem by some optimization method, like you want to find some, uh, you know, statistically speaking, there is a certain notion of uh, a posterior information, or you want to maximize the posterior information, it's a posterior point uh, of the parameter field. And uh, this is apparently an inverse problem you want to solve, and uh, we can solve it in the Bayesian uh, framework. Um, and then the next question is about the uh, tsunami, and uh, if you want to issue some early warning of the tsunami, right? So uh, um, the tsunami is essentially, you know, uh, um, it happened when there is an earthquake, very strong earthquake on the uh, sea floor uh, motion. I said, I see here, there like a sea floor, and that there is a, a earthquake happening here somewhere, and there is a strong uh, sea floor motion, and this motion will uh, generate some. Uh, in a water wave, and this water wave got propagated to uh, the coast city, for instance. Um, so before the water arrives at the coast city, you want to issue some early warning. Let's say maybe 20 minutes uh, in advance, half an hour in advance. So how do you do that, right? You basically you need to collect the signal, collect the data. So one of the way, quite a common way, is to place some of their in a tsunami here, and also the surface buoy. So once there is a earthquake happening. Typically, there is an acoustic signal. Um, you know, um, the acoustic uh, wave passing by uh, this tsunami, and this can be collected and sent to the surface buoy. And uh, then the signal can be, uh, you know, sent to the satellite and to the uh, station. So uh, uh, now the question is, uh, where do you place this uh, tsunami? Right, like each of the placement uh, is very expensive, and you also you have to well maintain it over the years. So uh, uh, because it's quite expensive and uh, uh, you need to uh, properly design a strategy or the approach to uh, place them in their uh, important locations. And uh, so uh, as you can see here, uh, what we do not know is actually uh, when and where the earthquake happened and also the magnitude, right? Like this is uncertainty. And uh, so subject to this uncertainty, how do we properly place the tsunami? This is a, an important question, and this question can be properly described in a framework of uh, optimal experimental design. And uh, yeah, there is uh, some model, like this model, also based on first principle model. Uh, it's a coupled elastic, because the ground uh, motion is elastic equation, and acoustic signal, and also gravity and wave equation. And also the water propagated from uh, you know, where it happened uh, to the coastal city by following some shallow water uh, equation. and. Uh, so essentially, I want to learn um, this parameter of where and when the earthquake happened through this uh, uh, signal described by you know, acoustic uh, equation, acoustic gravity wave equation. And, uh, and then uh, uh, once we, uh, we're clear uh, how to properly uh, allocate the sensors, essentially we can solve some uh, optimal sensor placement problem to maximize the information that they can get. Uh, for instance, there are some strategic locations uh, where you can place uh, this uh, tsunami. Um, all right, the last uh, example that I want to uh, show is a little bit different from the previous examples in the, you know, the geoscience and natural hazard. 
this is a bit more about the design, in particular the material uh, application field. Uh, so as we know that now in the semiconductor field, uh, if you go to finer and finer scale, smaller scale, so like, like about a two nanometer, one nanometer, it's, a, it's becoming very uh, hard to manufacture the semiconductor in that scale. And also becomes very expensive. Along the process, you have to not only, um, you know, well maintain the manufacturing process, but also uh, there is a lot of uh, computation involved um, uh, in this manufacturing. And there is new kind of a technology, uh, which is uh, the so-called uh, the self-assembly material. This kind of material, you have the two segments, like the red and the blue, right? So uh, this material, they have a different attraction force uh, that can properly form into different patterns. And by however, uh, this um, formation process or um, you know, this self-assembling process can be driven by some um, guideline or by some other material that you place there to guide this process. And uh, while well, this, this process can be properly modeled by also you know, uh, some pr first principle model like uh, self-consistent field theory or some non-local Cunningham equations. Um, and uh, while well, the optimization problem, for instance, if we want to uh, manufacture uh, this kind of uh, material, right? Like uh, this is, uh, let's say, one nanometer. But we cannot do that. We can do, uh, let's say, uh, five nanometer, or four nanometer. So we can place some substrate, essentially their you know, attraction material uh, first. And, uh, and then uh, and this material will attract the other like material um, into uh, this sort of like a morphology by self-assembly. And the question is, uh, where do you uh, place this is a substrate, right? Like uh, this is an optimization problem. And uh, um, you might have a different morphology instead of the laminar. You might have uh, some other, you know, this kind of a morphology you want to, um, you want the material to, to be um, essentially formed into. So here you can see uh, at the equilibrium state, the materials uh, will be formed uh, into this morphology. And on the right, you have some guide post. So essentially, once you place a guide post at these locations, the material uh, will be formed into this um, morphology. And uh, the question is, uh, how do you properly design the guided post locations, right? So this is an optimization problem. And of course, uh, since this is uh, quite uncertain, at the beginning, the materials are very uh, heterogeneous. And uh, uh, they might form into different um, patterns. Like, uh, for instance, this one would be the targeted one, but these ones are the defected ones. You want to reduce the defected uh, uh, material, and uh, you want to solve this problem under uncertainty by some stochastic uh, optimization approach. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much about the last uh, example. Um, but from all these different examples, uh, we can extract some of the you know common mathematical framework or mathematical problems to solve. So the first one is a. Uh, Suppose you have a, you know, some uncertain parameter in your system, a complex system, and we describe it by a mathematical model, uh, and you have some state variable or solution, like for instance, uh, how the water got propagated, how the material is formed, and uh, there are a lot of uncertainty in the system, and you can describe this system by mathematical models, and there are some quantities of interest from your s complex system, right? In the earthquake, um, sorry, in the tsunami, uh, scenario, you want to know uh, how high the water uh, will be when it arrives, uh, tsunami arrives at uh, the coast city. And this is one of the quantitative interest. Uh, another quantitative interest, let's say, um, in your material design, you want to quantify uh, the, defect, uh, the defect factor. And uh, so essentially, you want to propagate this uncertainty through your uh, complex system to some quantitative interest by solving this complex system or by you know, at least uh, you get the solution uh, from this complex system uh, using computing. And then the second problem is a learning problem, a BS inference problem with some data which is typically noisy and uh, uh, you want to update your distribution. Let's say here at the beginning, like maybe this is a one dimensional parameter in the black and uh, after you collect some knowledge, you update the distribution of this parameter. Maybe it becomes less uncertain, right? Uh, Instead of uh, distributing a large error, now it becomes rather narrow. Uh, that means like uh, you have a better information for this parameter. And then the next one is, uh, you know, how do you properly mm, acquire the data? 
Um, so this is an experimental design problem to best collect the data, uh, to place the, the sensors at the right location to collect the most informative data. And uh, so with a well-calibrated system, uh, you know, also with a quantitative interest, which might be your objective to optimize, uh, you, you have the last problem of a stochastic optimization. Either you want to control the system, like uh, for instance, you want to control the water extraction rate or injection rate, or you have some, uh, you know, um, optimal design problem, you want to design uh, the material, um, let's say, guided post or substrate. And uh, of course, uh, this is system, they're uncertain. The quantitative interest is also uncertain. It's, uh, it has a distribution instead of, uh, um, you know, one fixed value. So uh, you want to measure um, this randomness by certain um, probability or statistical or risk measure. Um, Okay, all right, so for all these different kinds of problems, there are some common challenges. Uh, one of the challenges, uh, these models, as I talked about, uh, typically described by uh, equations, uh, differential equations and partial differential equations, and uh, is a rather, you know, involved in mathematical models. They're quite expensive to solve. For instance, um, if you want to simulate, uh, let's say, the tsunami uh, for the water propagation, uh, you have to properly uh, discretize these equations, and uh, there is a, a really large degrees of freedom uh, in the discretization, like uh, billions of uh, um, degrees of freedom. And then uh, you have an equation that has uh, you know billions of degrees of freedom instead of uh, maybe um, you know what we learned in the, from high school. Perhaps you have an equation of uh, one variable, two variables. Now you have billions of variables. How do you deal with that? Right? You solve it by you know, supercomputers, high performance computing, and uh, um, but however, each of the solve is very expensive. Now you want to solve it many, many times because you have many samples or many uh, uncertain realizations, uh, but that would be very uh, challenging, right? So the second uh, challenge is about, uh, you know, the uncertainty themselves. The uncertain parameters that could be a, a rather complex instead of a very nice, let's say, Gaussian distribution or uniform distribution, you could have a, a quite locally supported distribution. And uh, also, uh, you have some like, uh, you know, sub-manifold. It's uh, uh, quite hard to sample from this kind of distribution. And moreover, uh, you might have a very high dimensional um, uncertainty. And typically, you have uh, this curse of a dimensionality. The computational complexity scales like exponentially or grows very fast with respect to the dimension you have. And uh, once you have the very high dimensions for the parameters, and it becomes very um, challenging to solve for this kind of problems. For all of, all of these examples, they're uh, typically either, you know, uh, parameters that depends on time or space, and uh, once you discretize them, they're very high dimensional. And uh, also, uh, I mentioned quite a few different optimization problems to solve. And these problems are typically also uh, quite a challenging to solve because they're non-convex. The system uh, is, uh, you know, is not simple, it's constrained by larger scale systems, and also is high dimensional. And uh, so in my research group, uh, we deal with these uh, challenges. Uh, we tackle these challenges by you know, leveraging these uh, different opportunities. Uh, the first is uh, for the large complex models, uh, which becomes very expensive to solve. Uh, we seek to build some uh, surrogate models, uh, which are rather um, cheap to evaluate. Uh, for instance, instead of like a, um, solving a model in supercomputer for this, uh, you can essentially evaluate this model in your laptop for seconds. And uh, we build these models with, with the required accuracy. Like, we wanted these models to be uh, very different from the high fidelity model, right? And also, um, um, we can uh, very fast evaluate these models. These models are typically nowadays built by a lot of uh, these AI models, these uh, machine learning models. and. Uh, and then the second is, uh, even though you know the parameter they're living in very high dimensional uh, space in the nominal high dimensional space, but uh, we can somehow compress the information, or we can extract the domino or the intrinsic uh, dimensions, which are typically rather low dimensional, and uh, so uh, we can build properly some compressor or uh, some projection from the very high dimensional space to the low dimensional space. In this way, we can reduce the computational a complexity significantly. And the last one is, uh, you know, for the optimization, uh, suppose you have a very high dimensional problem without using any, 
you know, local curvature or geometric information, it's really hard to explore around uh, which parameter would be, uh, you know, the minimum or the maximum. So uh, uh, using some derivative information uh, or geometric information or some adaptive uh, algorithms, uh, we can solve this algorithm optimization problems um, rather fast and also uh, independent of the dimension of the optimization variables. Uh, these are the opportunities that we explore by developing uh, different methods. Um, okay, so let me uh, come to the first uh, the first model of uh, how do we propagate this you know, uncertainty, not necessarily one dimensional, but rather very high dimensional, infinite dimensional sometimes, uh, through this system uh, to uh, quantitative interest. And this quantitative interest could be a uh, some scalar variable or even just the state variable, right? Like, uh, for instance, in the weather prediction, you want to predict their, um, the weather, of course, not uh, one region, but in a large region, then the quantitative interest will, um, will be uh, depending on not only one point, but uh, in many, many uh, points. And then here, one of the approach is uh, you know, using the scientific machine learning. In particular, one of the concepts uh, developed over the last few years is called uh, neural operators. Uh, neural means like the neural networks, artificial neural networks. Operators are actually, you know, the differential operators typically uh, what we use to describe their mathematical models. So, uh, uh, for instance, if you have a map from the parameter theta to your uh, state variable, and, uh, uh, or you have a, a map from your parameter to some quantitative interest, you want to map it um, by, instead of uh, passing through these complex models, uh, you want to use a neural network to learn it, right? The many different kinds of uh, neural operators have been developed over the last few years, like a Fourier neural operator, and DeepoNet, reduced basis, and a lot of uh, different neural networks. And uh, um, some of the neural networks that are standing out, actually, they're trying to compress the information, both the output and also the input from the very high dimensional uh, space uh, or functions uh, to low dimensional uh, subspace. So uh, we also leverage uh, this idea. We developed uh, some uh, the so-called um, projected neural network, derivative informed projected neural network. So essentially, we have a very high dimensional, um, you know, input and also very high dimensional output. We essentially uh, compress it to a relatively low dimensional subspace, and we build a neural network there to approximate uh, the map from the input to output. And uh, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, there are some examples. Um, for instance, there is uh, the Hamel's equation, uh, essentially one of the equations uh, that describe a lot of uh, the wave propagation uh, problems, uh, acoustic wave propagation, electromagnetic wave propagation. So uh, we have some uh, a parameter in the system, uh, essentially describe the medium property, and uh, we can propagate it through the uh, equation to the solution. And by using their, you know, um, the uh, deep net essentially derivative informed project neural network, and uh, um, we showed some scalability essentially for very high dimensional uh, space, um, like the full neural network would be millions of uh, dimensions, and uh, the reduced dimension could be like uh, thousands, and then um, the training cost is considerably reduced, and also the accuracy is uh, preserved. Like for instance, we use uh, active subspace. Uh, the top line, we can see the accuracy is preserved, in particular for a small number of training data. Uh, typically, uh, you know, it's quite hard to compute this training data by solving these complex systems. Suppose you have a very limited data, um, how can you best design your neural networks um, to essentially achieve high accuracy? Right. This is a, one of our uh, early work, and uh, we showed some uh, scalability. So the second problem is, uh, you know, uh, the inverse inverse problem. Uh, let me see. Uh, okay, so uh, there is some framework uh, to solve this inverse problem. Essentially, uh, using um, BS row. Uh, BS row says that if I have uh, some uh, prior knowledge about my system, my my parameter, and uh, if I have my data y, data y could be a collection of, uh, you know, um, your state variable pointing y somewhere, and uh, uh, so essentially, once you have this data, you have uh, the likelihood of your data conditioned on your parameter. And then the posterior information of this parameter is described by BS row. So now, um, 
you know, we can draw our samples from the posterior distribution instead of our prior um, distribution. But this problem is actually uh, very challenging. And uh, to deal with this uh, challenging problem, also because of, uh, you know, uh, about their, you know, the common challenges I mentioned before, like the complex model, high dimensionality. So there are some methods developed, like for instance, Laplace approximation, Markov chain Monte Carlo, and uh, some other uh, methods. And uh, uh, well, we've uh, contributed to this field by developing all this, um, well, the few different kinds of uh, fast and scalable methods and push them to high dimensions. And uh, we've uh, applied it to um, different scenarios. And a recent one uh, is on, you know, uh, try to find the maximum a posterior point, essentially, and where uh, it is most likely that the parameter should be. And uh, uh, for instance, if I have a, uh, the observation data and the simulated data, we want to match the observation data and the simulated data, right? The match is because uh, we can optimize the boundary condition uh, for the match. So essentially, we can solve some optimization problem to minimize uh, the misfit between the data uh, Y and also our model and prediction. And also there are some prior knowledge we want to build in. So in this case, we want to solve this problem by some optimization algorithms. And then uh, we can apply a neural operator to approximate from this parameter to our you know, map F. And then um, because of the you know, optimization problem typically involves some derivatives, some gradients, some Newton information, and some Jacobi information. So we build our neural operator using this Jacobi information. And uh, um, this will uh, enhance accuracy and also uh, the optimization of our problem. And uh, this is uh, some of their technical details, but essentially we use the same architecture, architecture of the neural network, but we use a different uh, training loss function, uh, like not only uh, for, the, for the map itself from their input to output, but also for the derivatives, like we take the derivatives of this output with respect to the input, and we build this information into our training process. And uh, um, we can do it in a scalable way. Essentially, we can compress information in low dimensions and the training becomes much more efficient. And uh, say here, uh, we have the Darcy flow problem that can describe the groundwater uh, transportation, uh, groundwater flow. Uh, for instance, here we have uh, some pressure, uh, some pressure one, pressure zero is pressure driven uh, flow. Uh, and uh, we have some random field, like a permeability field uh, here. And we have some uh, observations. We can collect the observations of uh, you know, this flow, and then we can solve the inverse problem. Uh, for instance, originally we have a, a permeability field that looks like this, and then uh, this is our most likely, uh, the map point, and the most likely point. And we can solve the problem by either the high fidelity solver, like a finite element method, one of their very classical high fidelity solver, and also uh, using uh, neural networks. You can see there is a pretty good match between their uh, our neural networks and also the high fidelity solver. And also the, the solve for you know, this optimization by using neural network is much, much faster, like uh, tens of thousands uh, speed up compared to the classical solver. And we can maintain the high accuracy uh, using the derivative of trained uh, information. Like on the left, you can see the uh, relative error is in general smaller than the right for different quantities, including for their uh, output itself, including for their uh, Jacobian, and also uh, the map point that we computed. Um, all right, it's about uh, uh, 40 minutes. So uh, I can either you know, go through the next couple of uh, um, problems of optimal experimental design and stochastic optimization, or if you have any questions, uh, I can stop here and we can talk about uh, you know, maybe more specific questions or, or maybe some conceptual questions. Pause, are there any, any questions at the, at the moment? Online, if you want to uh, uh, unmute, you, you, you're welcome to ask questions as well. Otherwise, we'll, we'll continue along. Okay, all right. Um, I do have one. Yeah, go ahead. It's somewhat um, disconnected from uh, the the technical details of yeah. it, but I don't imagine you had any experience working with Antarctic ice flows or groundwater 
uh, transport flows or tsunami well, experience or anything like that. So you must be working with someone else, partnering. Yeah, exactly. With uh, I'm place. working with a lot of other people. So, so how did domain you, scientist? How, how did you come to? Well, and, and how do you find that experience working with, with others? That I mean, how? This that's how much, actually a very good question. How much yeah. knowledge do you need to know about the particular systems that you're modeling? Yeah. Uh, or do you want to be ignorant? No, no, it's definitely because, not ignorant. Because that yeah. allows you to have some objectivity and not be constrained by maybe what some Yeah, so, so the domain knowledge is actually very, very important because for different domains, there are different models, different equations, different data. And, uh, but there are some, some common, uh, um, you know, under the hood, there are some, uh, let's say, mathematical equations Maybe uh, there are some equations for fluid, some other equations for optics, some other equations for, uh, let's say, wave propagation. Um, so uh, um, I have uh, the background knowledge of uh, computational mathematics. Uh, I know, um, you know how to solve, let's say, the toy uh, mathematical models. And then uh, uh, my expertise is on how to accelerate these uh, solutions. And then, um, but specifically for different domains, the different models that take years to build their, uh, you know, build the model, build their geometry, the mesh, and uh, collect the data. So uh, uh, I can, you know, uh, get access to some of the models, some of the data, and then once I get access to those, I can apply my algorithms to accelerate uh, for the different fields. Um, the interaction, initial intera interaction uh, comes from, um, you know, um, the, we attended conferences, in particular, uh, some of the conferences with related fields, uh, like uncertainty quantification, for instance, is one of their conferences that, that I often go to. There are many people who are working on um, engineering fields, other scientific problems. We talk about it, and uh, later on, we uh, build some uh, connection. We started to work on some, uh, let's say, um, baby toy problems and before we get to, to some serious problems. And uh, um, I was working in UT Austin for quite a few years. There are many experts working on different fields. I can, well, actually, um, I collaborated with, uh, at that time, my mentor and also some other uh, collaborator, in particular in the Institute of Odin. Uh, there's a lot of people working on different computational science and engineering problems. Uh, that's where also, uh, um, you know, how I build sort of like the connection, the collaboration. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Um, yeah. So the models that you're building are, do they learn from the actual results? So you feed back actual data yeah. over time and that helps teach the model? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, this is automatic goal. So essentially, uh, if you have uh, some uh, real world data and you want to use this real world data uh, to train your model, mm -hmm. to sort of like update your model, update the parameters in your model, and so your model can make uh, like more reliable uh, res predictions, right? Like for instance, uh, in the COVID case, uh, we can collect the data. Well, it's not we. There are some data available online, and people collected the data. Data we can build some models, and these models can take different aspects, like um, you know, number of uh, susceptible people, number of uh, infected cases, number of people in hospital, and uh, this is a dynamic process. And also, data are coming as uh, you know, streaming data. So we can constantly update our model. For instance, in the model, there are some parameters that describe their, um, the, the contact of people, right? Like uh, this contact could be uh, um, very important for the transmission. And uh, uh, so uh, we can update this parameter um, based on the data that we uh, obtained. And uh, after we update our model, uh, we can propose, let's say, how to properly uh, slow down their, uh, the disease by tuning some parameter, and this parameter has some uh, physical meanings. And uh, yeah, so in short, uh, there are some models uh, we tag with uh, realistic data. We update this model parameters. But there are many other models a bit more, um, let's say, at the moment, uh, academic, because uh, those data, first of all, is really large scale. Secondly, uh, it's not, it's not uh, uh, easy to get access to. And also, um, like for instance, Antarctica model, um, there are some like satellite data that we can use, uh, but it's not, uh, 
let's say the model itself is actually quite large scale, and the, the data itself is also very large scale. We can solve a simplified model uh, with a relatively speaking compressed data, but not the full blown uh, data and uh, the very realistic model. Yeah. And so once these models learn and you have a model that you are satisfied with the accuracy, how mm -hmm. portable is that model? So for example, yeah. you develop a model for yeah. Antarctic yeah. ice flow, yeah. and then you try to apply that model to Greenland yeah. ice flow. Yeah. Well, does it, does it work? N not really. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, uh, that's where, I mean, if, if it's not like the large language model, it pretty much like working in every different field up to di different level of accuracy. But uh, here, uh, um, the essence is that the like, mathematical model are uh, uh, the same, right? Like, but the geometry are different, and the condition are different, like the boundary conditions are different. So we cannot simply apply the model that we trained to another scenario. Even, I mean, the geometry would be different. It's not uh, easy to uh, transfer uh, these models across different, uh, um, different area. But however, there are some uh, underlying similarity between them. Uh, we can do some transfer learning. Uh, like this transfer learning would be taking the new knowledge based on your older uh, model that I trained it. You can fine tune it. And after the tuning, um, this model will be more accurate compared to the you know the previous model that you have. So, uh, so you can yeah. you can find those parameters that are sensitive yeah. to context. Yeah. And then when you move the model to a different context, yeah, you can specifically look for those parameters. Yeah. In that place. Yeah. And that, but the but some of the original models still apply. Uh, this is actually uh, uh, quite a uh, important question in the sense of uh, how do you find the proper parameters, right? Like uh, to tune, and uh, w what kind of parameters are more sensitive than the others? So um, this is sort of like the first order uh, questions that we ask, and there are some techniques we develop. For instance, uh, rather than find some uh, parameters at some local region, we can sort of like globally project the parameters into some more important space, and this space subspace uh, sort of like uh, informed by our data. So uh, um, yeah, essentially uh, we can fine tune our parameters and the most important are sensitive parameters um, to make our model um, you know, more predictable. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yes. thank you. Are your training data sets, are they, are they finite? Are they closed-ended or can you continuously like what? if you have an ice flow yeah. that's continuously moving across the, yeah, yeah. the, the, the landscape yeah, yeah. in some way, yeah. and you're continually receiving data, yeah. satellite data, ground measurement data, whatever, yeah. um, can you continually assimilate that data into your model to continue to refine further? Yeah, this is another very intriguing uh, question. In fact, this is actually a large research field. It's called a data assimilation. And for instance, in our weather prediction, we always do the weather prediction for the next, let's say, two weeks, but based on our current knowledge, right? Like um, in another month, perhaps we, cl we collected uh, more data, and based on that data, we're going to do the prediction for another two weeks. So essentially, uh, in the data simulation approach, you constantly feed your model with uh, the data. You constantly update your state variable, your parameters. And um, uh, so what I've described for many of the models are one step. But however, uh, this one step, once you extend to uh, uh, the cycles uh, of the time, uh, and uh, it'll become you know, continuously uh, informative model, a predictive model. Uh, but you need to do this uh, process like uh, periodically. Um, for instance, uh, right now, you know, over just let's talk about the numerical weather prediction. Over the last uh, dec few decades, every decade there is uh, about one day a more accurate prediction. And uh, since um, you know, the machine learning uh, taking off, last year there are a couple of papers published um, on how to use the AI models to properly learn the historical data. And then based on the new data, how do you uh, make further predictions using their AI models? Because the AI models is uh, like at least 10,000 times more efficient than their classical physics based models. So we can do a lot of uh, prediction, ensemble of predictions. So we can cover a lot of different scenarios like the, the hurricane, the, the tornado, 
And uh, uh, so at the same time, you can constantly update your AI models. And uh, uh, in fact, these AI models uh, start to be uh, um, incorporated into their, uh, let's say, European and US weather um, prediction models. And uh, that's very exciting. Yeah. Okay. Two more questions, unless someone, I don't want to keep. Yeah. Uh, assuming you're... So, something like weather modeling. Yeah. Um, uh, is maybe it actually needs an amalgamation or a, confeder or a federation of multiple models yeah. in some way? So, you have yeah. to have a ocean model, and you yeah. have to have an atmospheric model, and you yeah. have to have a land surface model. Like, yeah. In some way, and some of those things change very fast. That's right. And some of those things change very slow. Yeah. Are you able to? What how are you keeping track of all those? What What you are saying is a grand challenge at the moment. Yeah. It's, uh, it's multi physics. Uh, like you have a ice and ocean interaction. You have the weather, atmosphere, and water and ocean interaction. You have the land, uh, like uh, you know, precipitation on land, and also the ocean interaction. Right? There is a lot of uh, interactions you can properly describe by different physical models. Like uh, there is a sun, um, you know, radiation type models, and uh, there are also different time scales, as you mentioned. Like the ice flow, uh, let's say in years, and because uh, ice flow is not as fast as uh, the wind. I said the wind changes like a daily, for instance. Uh, so you have different time scales, and also you might have like a different space scales. Uh, you know, how do you properly model the whole uh, Earth, or you restrict it to a certain city? And uh, you have the multi-scale problem, multi-physics problem, and uh, um, you know, if you want to couple all these different models together, stability is a big issue. Um, and also, uh, because you have so different uh, scales in space and time, the computational cost could be very, very expensive. How do you properly incorporate these different scales of models together? I just do a very um, large research area. And uh, there are different approaches um, to address these questions and also um, developing some of the models. Uh, but uh, definitely, it's, it's far from uh, being a uh, complete for it. Um, yeah, so that's that's very exciting research area, actually. Yeah. Inga, Inga, you have a, a question you want to? And, and yeah, I Inga, have a question. Should... Yes, thanks. Um, I thank you for this conversation. Uh, incredible, fascinating research um, because of the complexities you just also within the last you know few sentences um, mentioned. I'm just curious because um, you mentioned geometry also for the ice flow. And if we're looking at tsunami uh, in particular, a lot has to do with the geometry of the coastal line and how far tsunami has a you know cascading effect. Um, so I was just curious, how do you model that <laughs> because um and then the second part maybe of it um there are of course uh, these uh, warning systems in place particularly for tsunami and the NOAA center is very known i think for uh, some of the simulation work so i'm just curious in how far your work and their work um overlap or even integrate with one another uh well um so the the problems that i presented are not necessarily that i work directly on these are the motivation uh, for instance, like for the tsunami warning system, um, there is a like a shallow water equation to describe the propagation of the tsunami from one place to another. And, uh, you know, we can design some, um, as you mentioned, it really depends on the geometry. But uh, for now, we have like, a, uh, let's say, some synthetic or some uh, academic geometry that we design. And uh, um, our research comes into uh, how to you know, propagate these models, how to solve these models in a very fast. And once we develop this kind of algorithm, how to deploy it, uh, it has to be uh, collaborated with a uh, domain scientist and uh, with the practitioners. Uh, this is uh, not uh, something that I've done uh, yet uh, in terms of the tsunami or warning. Uh, we're pushing to this direction. Certainly, there's no shortage of, I think, applications. That, yeah. Um, and actually, I saw online we have a, a resident uh, ice sheet person here, okay. an ice flow person uh, at Georgia Tech. Alex Robel is online. Okay. In Inga has actually done some simulation in her past careers of I see. urban areas, cities, urban areas, city. and, okay. and trying to predict emerging properties that might come from 
traffic neighborhood redesign traffic yeah. uh, public health yeah um, uh, how those interact with yeah uh, uh, variables of weather and climate and, mm -hmm. uh, also including hum yeah. human behavior yeah yeah I think uh, yeah. I think yeah, all these different like kinds of uh, application areas are really fascinating, and also they provide a strong motivation for designing like uh, algorithms how to best deal with these different models. Um, you know, I, I'm a bit more let's say like uh, from the school of uh, science, computational science and engineering, we focus a bit more how to develop a, a useful and deployable algorithms, and then this can be uh, let's say collaborated with some other domain scientists to really solve their uh, practical problems. And uh, but under the hood, there is a, you know, this common algorithm uh, that we can uh, develop. Um, but for each specific field, it really takes you know, like years of effort to build this sense uh, that's that are really useful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that there are some audience working in the fields that uh, just mentioned and uh, could be further uh, collaboration in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is there anyone right now here at Georgia Tech that you're particularly collaborating with? Uh, well, a um, particular problem that you're working on? Uh, yeah, so there are a few um, uh, faculty members from aerospace, for instance, uh, Yunxin and Chen uh, from uh, ISYE. And uh, uh, there is a professor from uh, a math department. Uh, we're talking at the moment a bit more on their practical algorithm uh, complexity analysis and uh, uh, algorithm development. Um, so on the larger scale, uh, let's say computation, there are some uh, people from computational chemistry, they're solving uh, DFT type of uh, equations, and they need some like uncertainty uh, quantification. We, co we collaborated on a proposal last year for DOE proposal, but was not successful. Um, yeah, so uh, there are uh, a professor from a mechanical engineering uh, working on materials and who also collaborated on uh, a proposal um, before and uh, uh, hopefully there will be more uh, that I can get involved and uh, collaborate. Yeah. Very nice. Well, I, I, I didn't want to take away if you had any concluding remarks that you want to make uh, or, or. Yeah, I think that's pretty much the message that I want to mention. Um, you know, there is a the very exciting scientific machine learning AI models that we develop for solving quite a challenge of complex systems. And I want to enable this sort of like predictive uh, digital twin, in the sense of uh, want to create some digital kind of part of the physical systems. And uh, how do we learn the system? How do we properly collect the data? How do we steer around their systems? That's, that's uh, uh, the kind of problems that, that I'm interested in, and I'm looking for some collaboration. Yeah. Okay. Very good. If there's no more questions, we can. Yeah, go ahead, please. I also have a quick question with regards yeah. to like the quantification of uh, the reduction of the uncertainty. Yeah. So, for example, you mentioned before earlier that physics was a governing structure in some regards to like yeah. weather and so on and so forth. Yeah. But with semiconductors, yeah. You deal with some atomic levels of physics. Yeah. That are a little bit unknown yeah so how do you guys cross validate and ensure that reduction of uncertainty is genuine uh well this is actually a very good question yeah very good question so the uncertainty uh, the reason that we have uncertainty is uh we don't really have much knowledge about it right so uh, uh then we can um acquire the data or we can collect the observation data we have to think that the, the data give us some information Otherwise, uh, we want to be able to reduce uncertainty. So we rely, we rely on the data. I mean, we have the first principle of physical models, but these models, uh, you have to equip them with, uh, uh, let's say, like for the semiconductor uh, design, for the self-assembly material. These materials at the beginning, they're completely in a random phase. And, uh, um, you know, the self-assembling process will depend on uh, we can describe it by some physical equations, like uh, the non-local kind of Hill equations, but there are some parameters we don't really know. And so we can map observations of this assembly process, like I'm collecting some uh, X-ray data, let's say. And then based on this data, uh, we can, you know, compute some summary statistics, like uh, 
spectrum power using some Fourier transformation, for instance. And then uh, with this data, uh, we can learn or can infer uh, this parameter during the, this process because there is some parameter range or particular parameter that, I, that gives you their process and matches the data, right? Like, uh, so uh, learning this models from data is actually very important. And that's that's a key, in a sense. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank yeah, you very right. much. Thank yeah. You. yeah.